Hi, welcome to the West Asian. This is Besta Masaez, and in this episode of the West Asian, we're talking to the world-renowned expert on geopolitics, Dr. Parag Khanna, on an incredible subject, the new geopolitical space, West Asia. I personally learned a lot, and I can't wait to share it with you. So let's begin. Thank you very mm-hmm. much, Dr. Parag Khanna, for being with West Asian today. My pleasure. I guess the appropriate way to start is to define uh, West Asia. You've been very vocal about the term and the concept. What is West Asia for you? What are its boundaries, if it has any? Well, I think it's very important to begin by pointing out that West Asia is not a contested concept in geography. It is fundamentally geographic. And geographers don't disagree about the the boundaries uh, of West Asia. It's defined as including what some call the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf states, all the way through the Anatolian Peninsula, uh, the Caucasus region. These are all part of West Asia, certainly Southwest Asian countries, such as uh, Iran and Pakistan are part of this West Asian concept as well. What might be disputed politically is whether Russia forms, you know, Northwest Asia or North Asia. And of course, Russia is something of an anomaly in terms of its political geography. But in terms of natural geography, geographers include Russia within Asia. But geography itself is perfectly clear on what constitutes West Asia and Asia in general. And I feel that, at least for me in in my work, uh, when people have written about Asia for the past uh, 20 years or more, they have basically been looking at greater China. And because of that skewed uh, understanding, which is really a political frame or a geopolitical frame, they have ignored geography itself. And as I said, though, if you are being loyal to the concept that stems from geography, the idea of Asia itself and even West Asia within Asia, there really is not a debate about the boundaries and the regions that are included in this idea of Asia and West Asia. Obviously, conflict in the region is is a major issue. And uh, even if you call it West Asia, it's still a very conflicted region. What's the role of conflict in West Asian system? Well, it's uh, quite defining, of course. And let's remember that a region can be peaceful or conflictual. That doesn't mean that it isn't still a coherent geographical region or that it isn't a system. And this is one of the points that I emphasize very strongly at the beginning of the futurization, which is that a system actually is a very formal meaning in international relations theory. And it's a measurement of the intensity of relations between actors. They can be violent relations. Europe has been a system for many, many centuries, and it has been a violent and conflictual system for most of that history as well. But it is still very much a system. Now, Asia has never been referred to in the literature, in theory, or in uh, you know, historical work as a system. And that is a huge oversight. You never see the word Asia and system next to each other. And that was, again, one of my principal motivations was to explore to what extent is Asia a system. And it turns out that Asia is very much a system. The degree of diplomatic and of economic interaction, institutions, infrastructure, investment, and so forth between Asian countries is larger than Asia's collective relations with any other part of the world besides itself. So by the absolute most formal definition of a system, Asia is a system. Yet no one has ever bothered to treat Asia as a system. We tend to take these sub-regions, for example, East Asia or Pacific Asia, Southeast Asia, and for the purposes of our conversation, West Asia or Southwest Asia. And indeed, Southwest Asia is most certainly been a system uh, for many, many periods of history. It's been, a, it's been um, a, a system during the times of the caliphates. It's been a system during the colonial eras, even when divided among European powers, it still had system-like characteristics in terms of the, um, the conflicts between uh, colonial powers in the region. So even in the Napoleonic era, there's system uh, attributes. 
Of course, under the Ottoman Empire, it was very much part politically of the Ottoman system and therefore most certainly belonging to uh, actually one integrated polity, uh, as it were. So obviously a system under, under all historical eras of colonialism. And now even as a set of independent states, whether we are talking about Turkey, the Gulf or the Levant region or Iran and Pakistan, uh, and even extending into Central Asia, what we are witnessing is in incrementally and bit by bit, the restoration of these system-like characteristics based on sovereignty in which sovereign countries, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the other Gulf states, Iran, Pakistan, others, are rekindling ties with each other. They are finding their economic complementarities. They're building infrastructure with each other. They are fighting wars with each other as well. Refugee flows, trade relations, illicit trade, commodities transfers, all of these are evidence of system-like uh, roles and uh, characteristics. A couple of years ago in, in a forum, you proposed the concept of West Asia to an Arabic forum. What were the reactions? How did they take that? Well, I was simply reminding them that they live in the West Asian geography, and therefore they are geographically West Asians. One of the things I do in the book is to chide Australians. I say Australians are white Asians, because Asia is not, does not mean a particular culture. It does not confer a particular kind of you know, political hegemony. It's simply a geographical reference. So Australians are white Asians, Japanese, Russians are Asians. And indeed, I was telling the, the Arabs, basically the Gulf Arabs, I said, you are West Asian. It wasn't a, a proposal. It was a statement of fact. And to them, it was, of course, it was also a political statement because I was reminding them of their geography because my purpose at that forum was to explore and to quantify and to um, and to look at the future trends when it comes to relations between West Asia and East Asia, whether it is the energy trade with the Pacific Rim, whether it is the Belt and Road Initiative and new uh, overland infrastructures that are connecting these markets, whether it is investment trade, whether it is strategic and military ties, um, the deepening relations between West Asia and East Asia uh, have really intensified in the past three decades, the past 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And much of what, uh, you know, what I've been writing about is the story of how far Asia has come in becoming a system in precisely the last 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union and what scenarios or potential lie ahead. So Arabs can very much be West Asians. Turks are absolutely West Asians. You can call yourself Anatolians, you can call yourself Turks, but you are geographically speaking, you are the populations that presently reside in the West Asian geography. So in that sense, it wasn't a political statement, but of course it has these very strong political overtones because Arabs have, uh, for all Arabs who are alive today, they can remember themselves only as being in the so-called Middle East because their geography, their political cartography has been so overwhelmingly defined by the divisions imposed upon them by the European colonial uh, era and by the nomenclature of this phrase Middle East. But let's remember that if you are in India, for example, in, in, the, in, the, in the Ministry of External Affairs, it's the division of West Asian relations or, or affairs. It is not called the Middle East. East of the Middle East, people call the Middle East the Middle East. They call it West Asia. And they've always called it West Asia. So I think we are part of this story of the last 30 years and perhaps the next 30 years is evolving beyond the inherited cartographic nomenclature that we are accustomed to and going back to the more natural and accurate uh, uh, vocabulary which is to refer to West Asia as West Asia. And I think the, um, the more I work with Arab governments you know, and, uh, and uh, academic institutions and the, the community uh, more broadly, the more I see that all in their day-to-day -day lives, they already know that their relations in the real tangible sense are more intense 
with uh, the, the geographies and countries to the east than to the west. But intellectually, they're still trapped in the prison uh, of using vocabulary like Middle East. But over time, these uh, discrepancies will, I think, iron themselves out. So that brings us uh, to my next question. Why is it so important? What's, what's in the name? Why should we go down that road and, and try to change what's already there, the Middle East to, to West Asia? Is it a psychological? Well, it's not. Absolutely. I mean, it is psychological and that which is psychological has as much of an overhang and effect on our strategic thinking and the decisions that we make, the options that we build for ourselves, the priorities that we set, as it does for individuals. It is every bit as important to um, you know, use the correct vocabulary and definitions um, and have an accurate outlook. Um, in international relations as it is in interpersonal relations. So words matter, psychology matters. Um, but it, that doesn't mean that it is some kind of a mission that I am on or other people are on. It's simply an accurate statement of reality. It's not a cause. I mean, I applaud you for creating a, 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 a portal and a publication called The West Asian because it is a sign of the times. But we are doing this because it's accurate, because it's correct, not because, you know, I mean, it's not that it's life or death for you and me, but it is part of this transition that, uh, that the region is on. Do you see any countries in particular taking the lead in, in that shift or any event for that matter, accelerating that shift? Well, you know, the, the, uh, there isn't what you might think of as a noble or progressive singular state actor that is pr pr producing or providing an overarching vision for West Asia to which all parties subscribe. I would like to see something like that. You know, I and many, many others have proposed that there be a Gulf security conference, that countries in the region, whether it's Iran, Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others form a, um, in an association, not even an association, because that would be too strong a word given the hostility uh, between uh, players in the region, but simply a forum. The, mo the simplest, and, and some people refer to the six party talks with North Korea uh, as perhaps a template, because that's all it was. It was just talks. And as you very well know, at this point in time, it would be a huge accomplishment to have Iran and Israel actually talk directly to each other in the same room and to have Saudi Arabia there and the Emirates there and Turkey, of course, you know, would be very important. So the geography, again, should be dictating which players set the terms of the conversation rather than whether the United States wants Iran there or not. You know, for example, I've worked uh, many times in Pakistan and in Pakistan, uh, you know, with U.S. foreign policy having uh, traditionally, meaning in the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 years, often shaped the relationships they can have, I have found a huge dis discrepancy between the Pakistani outlook that they need to have a gas pipeline from Iran to bridge their energy shortages, and that they have, uh, you know, religious and other uh, cultural and demographic ties, and of course, a very, very long border with Iran. But the United States never allowed in any of the discussions in the post 9-11 security environment as it pertained to Central Asia and the so-called AFPAC. The truth is that AFPAC was AFPAC Iran. But for you know 15 years, you literally could not have an AFPAC Iran US discussion. But it's just a denial of geography to conduct your diplomacy in that way. So again, another reason why words matter, right? So we need to have a West Asian forum of some kind, and it has to involve every country in West Asia. And that does include Israel, and that does include Iran. So, um, you know, but of course, again, when I talk about inclusion of these countries, as, uh, as I think we agree, there isn't one that stands out as the leader, right? The neutral arbiter or convener of these uh, states in a manner that everyone will subscribe to. China can't do it, Russia can't do it. Europe obviously still has a bit of the colonial aftertaste as well. And individual European countries still pay play favorites. And of course, America has lost pretty much all credibility. So how could you instantiate or bring to light 
uh, such a forum is the challenge that we face right now. I would like to see, again, all of the West Asian countries do that. Uh, perhaps that's something you will do. <laughs> well, it is a really hard task because whenever I talk to um, be a diplomat or a scholar, even in Turkey, they are very much reserved about the idea of West Asia. They are still not comfortable referring to themselves in that way, which is surprising to me because everything that I see about Turkey is somewhat going into that direction, at least from the pro-government side of things. They would still prefer to call themselves Middle Eastern for some reason. Is that true? I mean, in the yeah. sense that, uh, you know, what I've been looking at Turkish foreign policy for for a long time and, and uh, various terminologies have been used like neo-Ottomanism or 360 degree strategy. And at different times, even during the Erdogan you know, period, uh, these terms have been used. And what they all basically connote is a desire to you know, build stable ties with uh, you know, Russia to the north, across the Black Sea, um, countries of the Caucasus and all the way to the Turkic countries of Central Asia. And of course, hoping to have a decisive impact on the future shape of the, of, again, the political map of uh, Syria and Iraq, um, you know, on again, off again relations with Israel and, you know, economic ties being strong with Gulf countries, even though the political ties are very poor, being opposite, on opposite sides of different conflicts. So whether we call it neo-Ottomanism, whether we call it 360 degree strategy, whether it's called an Eastern strategy, it basically is all indicative of the fact that Turkey no longer sees itself as aspiring to European Union membership, to being officially included in a, you know, the Western club. And therefore, it very much has realized that it is a West Asian country and that Asia is its future um, as much as any other trajectory. So it doesn't matter if a Turkish diplomat says, okay, yes, we are now West Asian and we now have a West Asian strategy. The fact is that's exactly what Turkey is actually doing. And I think that's what matters. Yes, I think um, absolutely. In the, in the last four years, perhaps after the coup attempt, all the foreign policy objectives and agenda have sort of shifted. And, and maybe that was the shift. And um, But I think what I'm referring to is that um, the concept of West Asia in Turkish foreign policy was was initially introduced by political actors that you would perhaps call leftists. And I think their reservations are more of domestic concerns of being associated with parties that they would not feel comfortable with. You mentioned that the countries and nations in the region uh, would not fall for a, a new Cold War uh, scenario. And it sort of resonated with me in a way that um, you think of this West Asian process as an irreversible process. Is it an irreversible process? I think that the you know geographical intensity, or again going back to this idea of a system, you know West Asia becoming an ever more intensely uh, interrelated, which is again not to say positively integrated, but simply interdependent system. That I think is irreversible. We'll see this. We've seen it already in energy trade. We see it in conflictual uh, issues around settling borders. We see it in migration flows, obviously, and I think it's worth reminding everyone that the flow of Syrians and Iraqis and others uh, into the West, into Turkey and across Turkey is very much as formal evidence of the system-like characteristics. When you have two populations that have zero interaction, they do not form a system. When you have millions of people flowing across a nominal, you know, arbitrary political border into a neighboring country, that is a system. Right. Uh, again, it's not a haphazard, messy, undesired process, but it is evidence that the relations are irrevocably, the fates of two countries are irrevocably tied to each other. What is a nation if not its people? And when people are flowing back and forth across these boundaries, it is evidence that those two countries are tied together in the system. So we see it in conflict, we see it in demographic flows, we see it in commodities trade, we see it in investment patterns, because of course, 
it is the Gulf countries that lead the region in investing across the region, uh, especially in the war-torn countries, whether it is um, Iraq or whether it is the attempt to rehabilitate Re Lebanon. We can, of course, extend this to North Africa. Uh, you know, Egypt, Egypt and other countries are very dependent on uh, financial support and capital flows and so forth, uh, you know, fiscal assistance from Gulf countries as well. And then there's Turkey's role, uh, very much so, you know, militarily, um, and uh, infrastructurally when it comes to the Levant region uh, also. So, you know, again, it is not happening in a predefined, supranational, you know, trans-sovereign, uh, you know, multilateral way. It is happening bottom-up. It is happening uh, based upon individual countries pursuing what they think is their national interest, very haphazardly. But the fact that it is happening at all and that those interactions are more intense than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago and before, is evidence that this West Asian region is finding ways, again, not positive, and I always have to emphasize this, it's not about a positive teleology, it's not about becoming like the European Union, there will never be an Asian Union, uh, there will never be a singular, you know, Asian, uh, you know, recognized uh, uh, legitimate hegemon like China, that will never happen. Asia is not taking the European path. So it is this bottom up and conflicted way, but it is this intensity of relations. And my hope is that because it is so chaotic, right? And you know, like you and I can probably agree, there isn't a rhyme or reason or pattern. Like I said, there is no predetermined direction. One hopes that countries say to themselves and to each other, we are fighting it out pointlessly, we are going in circles, this makes no sense, maybe we need to have a regional forum and see if we can redraw the lines in a way that everyone agrees with, right? And that's how you move from tactics to strategy. That's how you move from reaction to foresight. Um, and that's how you move from conflict maybe towards a slightly more stable vision. Um, and that is, uh, uh, perhaps you agree, you know, the best uh, that we can hope for for the next, uh, you know, two to five years in the region. How do you interpret uh, the latest standoff at the Eastern Mediterranean between France and, and Turkey and Greece? Uh, this is interesting. Uh, you know, it's an example of a number of things, first of all. Of course, it's an example of individual, uh, again, European countries like France who, who have their, um, you know, clear sense of who their allies and friends are in the region. And again, they're still playing the kind of 19th century sort of uh, political alignments. On the other hand, it's also an example of an issue that I have you know, spent a lot of time working on, which is really the geopolitics of infrastructure and what is known as functional geography. So the geography of natural resource deposits and uh, turning resources into reserves, those reserves then become contested in terms of their uh, political designation, which exclusive economic zones do they fall into? Uh, how does it relate, of course, to now the institutional arrangements like uh, you know, Cyprus as an EU member uh, versus Turkey as a non-EU member? And one of the things that uh, I you know, certainly uh, have made this case and I simply uh, endorse their view is that before Cyprus was made an EU member, what the condition should have been that there be a resolution to the Northern Cyprus dispute, because then, of course, Europe no longer has the, uh, the leverage, the institutional leverage and that conditionality. And Europe, you know, historically has made this mistake in other areas as well where it gives away too much. It doesn't use the conditionality enough um, that it has, and then it bargains it away by allowing Cyprus to be a member with a still active territorial dispute. And as you know very well, it is within the articulation of European rules that uh, countries with outstanding territorial disputes are not meant to be made EU members. An exception was made here as a way of um, you know, siding with Cyprus. But as we can clearly tell from this uh, dispute, uh, it did not help to resolve the dispute at all. And I think that is very problematic.
Macron has uh, called NATO brain dead before. I feel like his latest statements endorse that and he's trying to maybe force out a European army out of this situation. Are we going that direction? Are we going to see a European army? Maybe it would be something that would accelerate a West Asian integration? Well, I think there are several things going on here at the same time that are all in and of themselves, each is deep and interesting. I mean, the idea of whether NATO's mission is um, you know, sufficiently motivating for European countries to, um, uh, to align and to create a common you know, military directorate and so forth. This idea has been around since the 1950s. And of course, has nothing to do with the Eastern, you know, or it's nothing to do with West Asian issues, mostly to do really with Russia. And even to this day, of course, we don't find that Russia is a sufficiently motivating adversary for Europe to increase its defense spending or to form a common army. Now, in the hierarchy of threats that Europe perceives, um, what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean would rank very, very low. So therefore, you know, whatever Macron is thinking to himself, obviously this is not something that agitates the Germans or the Swedes or the Finns or anyone really. So what he's doing is, of course, bilaterally motivated. And again, as I said, this is just France being France and Macron thinking in 19th century kinds of terms. His attitudes on Turkey, on Russia, and other issues differ, obviously, quite considerably uh, in, in some ways. Europe itself is clearly not coherent, whether the issue is geopolitical or geopolitics, energy, uh, or other kinds of relations. By and large, what we find is that European countries, particularly Germany, you know, want to increase their commercial engagement very much with Russia and other actors, and they strongly resent American interference in trying to isolate their economic ties. That applies very much to Iran. So this is a good opportunity to bring Iran to the question. The West Asian role in the world economy and in regional geopolitics and how it in some ways divides the West. Because on Russia and Iran, Europe and America differ quite considerably. Uh, I personally take the European view to the extent there is one, because I do not see that the attempt at isolation and sanctions of these uh, very large countries actually being successful in bringing about coercive political change. In the case of Iran, it hasn't worked in more than 40 years. In the case of Russia, Putin has outlasted the last three American presidents and will probably outlast the next two. Uh, so, you know, we should not adopt by default an American mindset on these issues. We should actually adopt the geographical mindset, which is that, you know, this is the geographical reality and to artificially try to suspend that reality by attempting to isolate large countries with so many neighbors and such deep historical and economic ties and potential with each other is quite simply foolish. We might as well embrace the inevitability that eventually these countries are going to have to find uh, you know, a, a modus vivendi with each other and push in that direction. And so intellectually, I certainly feel that Europeans are closer to that position than any American is. Going back to West Asia, how much do you think Islam plays a, a role? I have uh, long believed that it plays very little role, quite frankly. And this is uh, a debate that goes back to the 1990s, you know, when Samuel Huntington and others elevated the idea of uh, cultural spheres into civilizational kind of actors. And that was a, a huge intellectual mistake, quite frankly. It was just a methodological error uh, that he made, and it obviously misdirected quite a lot of people. So Islam is a religion. One can just refer to it as a cultural space, but it cannot be seen as a civilizational actor, not since the caliphates, uh, and even really arguably the Ottoman Empire not acting really on behalf of all global Muslims. So you haven't had a coherent Islamic geopolitical identity um, or, or uh, you know, activism uh, in many, many centuries. And today you certainly have nothing of the sort. You have the internal cleavages between Sunni and Shia, the regional disparities or discrepancies such that they really have almost no connections with each other. North Africa does not have any meaningful ties to Indonesia, more or less zero, um, you know, nor even to Pakistan. 
um, other than Saudi Arabia's relations with those countries, which are a little bit more intense. So to speak of a common Islamic policy on anything is, is more or less a farce. And we see this now, we've seen this uh, twice significantly in the last uh, couple of decades. The first is in the condemnation of the American Gulf Wars and occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan and even the military troop presence of the Gulf countries. Uh, of course, nothing coherent was done against it. To this day, of course, America considers many of these countries some very strong allies. And then secondly, of course, uh, China and the Uyghurs, uh, where again, you have absolutely zero Islamic coherence of any kind. So I don't think that we should bring in religion. I think that religion should be thought of as a subordinate issue, even in domestic politics, let alone in international politics. Islam does not even pass the test of being a decisive factor in the domestic policies and attributes of, of, of governance and public policy on a day-to-day -day level in most Islamic countries. And again, I'm speaking about Indonesia and Pakistan, even more or less Egypt, which is, of course, a military dictatorship. Um, and of course, the Muslim Brotherhood does not fare particularly well uh, in, in these countries. Even when it does fare well electorally, as it did in Egypt, it is unable to govern. So if we think about these things logically and hierarchically, you know, maybe actually reverse from the bottom up, if Islam isn't even effective in individual domestic contexts, we should be very dubious of the idea that it has any significance, uh, you know, geopolitically and globally. One last question then. China. China is a divider or a unifier in the region? I think that's a wonderful question, a very interesting question, because, uh, you know, I've been looking at China's growing role in West Asia for the last you know, 15 years. Uh, it's growing ties uh, with the Gulf countries, with the energy trade, and what begins as trade ties have become investment ties, investment ties become military relations, not alliances, but military ties. You know, we see a trade in weaponry and so forth. We see, um, you know, a mutual kinds of uh, activities in the military uh, sphere, if you will. And now we uh, you know, have more than 10 plus years of China's growing relations with Israel. Uh, we have Turkey as part of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, certainly Russia is the single most compliant country in the world when it comes to China's Belt and Road Initiative. And of course, uh, China's presence in the energy markets and infrastructure uh, in Iraq uh, as well and now potentially, eventually, in any type of Syrian post-conflict reconstruction. And India, one could say similar things about India's growing role and ties and relations with the West Asian countries. India most certainly wants to have uh, natural gas linkages from Iran, which is, of course, something that the United States opposes. Um, and India has, has very much strengthened its ties with Israel, has very positive relations with Saudi Arabia, obviously the largest share of the foreign population in the Gulf countries is Indian uh, nationals. So both China and India over the last 30 years uh, are playing much, much stronger roles, much more influential, and to some degree constructive roles in the region. Whether it is a uniter or a divider is, of course, a much more a complex uh, question because China is trying to have positive ties with Iran and Saudi Arabia at the same time. That creates some tension. It's trying to have positive ties with Israel, as well as Israel's adversaries at exactly the same time. And this is the sort of superpower diplomatic dilemma. You know, how do you pursue your interests in the region with these countries that are uh, antagonists? And can China uh, potentially, again, play a role in uh, bringing about this sort of West Asian forum, you know, that you and I are talking about? Uh, I don't think that China is willing to stick its neck out yet in that way. It's obviously much more interested in being sort of a free rider uh, and in simply, you know, getting bilaterally what it is looking for. Um, and that's sufficient for Chinese interests for now. So I wouldn't call it either a uniter or a divider. It's more self-interested. But as it relates to infrastructure projects and Belt and Road, um, I do think that in the long term, one can envision that whether it is gas pipelines or highways that cross from China through Tajikistan and Afghanistan and Iran uh, to Turkey, the possibility of freight rail and other networks that, that do traverse from Turkey through Iran into Pakistan and potentially uh, overland to China. This does create the potential for adversarial neighbors 
to create you know, a more mutually beneficial relationship with each other based upon economics and commerce. And that does, there's plenty of historical precedent for that in the sense that if one finds that one is sharing a railway or a pipeline and so forth, and it does bring you know, economic benefits to both sides, it is less likely that they would want to destroy that asset. Um, we see cases of the opposite happening as well. For example, Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, both benefit from gas pipelines that go from Russia to Ukraine to Europe, but that doesn't stop Russia from invading Ukraine, right? So history provides us a lot of evidence of, um, you know, uh, uh, infrastructures uh, for, for trade and exchange communications being mutually beneficial and that helping countries develop more positive relations. Of course, the post-war history of Europe is the best positive example, but we also have negative examples. And again, this brings us back to the present moment in West Asia. What will the countries decide to do? You know, can they, if one thinks about everything from the countries that are rich in, uh, in agriculture, in commodities, in oil and gas, in water, uh, versus those that are starved of them, those that have the labor force and versus those that need the labor force, and all of the other ways in which West Asian countries could have a more optimal division of labor and even a more optimal political geography, there is a lot of progress that we could envision and that we could map, physically map, and that we could help these governments to realize in a common forum with each other. But what is, of course, getting in the way is the current geopolitical predicament and, and tension. So, you know, we have to try and untie this knot that, uh, that we are in right now. Oh, wow. Untying the knot was actually the title of my presentation, uh, defending uh -huh. thesis. <laughs> so, um, I'd, I'd like to read that. Yeah, interesting that you, you ended the conversation with that. Um, quite fascinating. Thank you very much, Dr. Kana. I learned so much from you today. I hope to be with you again, uh, maybe sometime in the future. My pleasure. Well, best of luck with the West Asian, and I hope it grows uh, beyond a publication into a great diplomatic initiative uh, for the region. So uh, do keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much.